All right. Well, hey guys, you know, welcome to the webinar. Uh, here you're going to be learning all kinds of actionable tips about what goes into a good cold email and what goes into a crappy one so you don't make those mistakes and send out crappy cold emails. Um, so we've got Jeremy from QuickMail here and we have Heather from Salesfolk. First question, you guys, uh, how can entrepreneurs leverage email as a tool to help them grow their companies? And Jeremy, Jeremy do you want to take that? Well, I was about to say that you can take the lead <laughs> of the audio. Okay. Go for it, Heather. So, uh, obviously, you can use cold email to start sales conversations uh, to get new customers, but you can also use it for business development, product feedback, anything where you need to start a conversation with someone. Um, and uh, we got our first 100 customers through cold email, mostly a little bit of referral and inbound, but mostly cold email. So. It does work. You just need to find the right audience to target and have the right message and the right product or service that solves their pain point. Yeah, pretty much what she said. She, she did it very well. I would also add a spin that I've seen a lot of people trying in B2C type of businesses and it's kind of harder. Mm -hmm. um, it feels more like, yeah, it feels more like spam and interruption. So it, it seems very well suited to B2B type of business. And whenever you actually need some, to shorten the time to response and, uh, and then go at scale with minimum budget, I think it's definitely a channel that you have to look at um, and, it's, you know, and then try out. Um, so Heather, you got your 100 customer like that. Uh, that's a good question. I was trying to figure out how many I got through, through that in quick mail. I think I didn't get the first one through, through cold emails because I actually kick it off uh, uh, a group of entrepreneurs, uh, a Facebook group from a Facebook group. But after that, we went into emails and probably, yeah, the next, the next 80 customers were, were done like that. Yeah, definitely. No, it, it can work, that's for sure. It's also a very versatile channel. I mean, I, I, we have lots of people actually, like you said, trying uh, to get market validation initially, like doing different verticals. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they try to validate what they are building, um, you know, trying to figure out who will be a champion uh, helping me developing the product with or early adopter. And then after that, they switch to demos and selling. So mm -hmm. I like the versatility of the channel as well. And at the end of the day, uh, even with content marketing, social, and everything else, um, it's pretty much still the most effective channel for generating Creating revenue and closing deals other than maybe in-person events which are not scalable or very cost effective. Mm -hmm. And so um, cold email still beats social about 10 to 15x. Not to say that you shouldn't be doing social or content marketing, we do all of the above. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, social and waiting on inbound leads will only take you so far. So. Um, you kind of, you need to go beyond that if you want to beat your, your targets for growth. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, and, it, and the speed as well, I really like as well, because the inbound is like a long time game, a long, a long term game, where the, uh, the email, you can validate things very, very quickly, and you can't do that with inbound, or it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I know. I think this is just so powerful to hear because you guys have actually done it, right? I mean, you guys have built your own businesses on cold email. And uh, so, yeah, you're living proof that it works. And yeah, I'm just psyched to hear more about your strategies here. So let's move on to the next question. All right, this one's kind of a fun one. So pretend you have a new and untested business idea and how would you approach cold email and what would be kind of your strategy? Like, where would you begin? So, um Definitely I would begin with thinking who the audience I'm targeting is to begin with before doing any writing or anything at all. Um, because uh, even if I know my value propositions and my benefits, it doesn't matter uh, if I'm not thinking about my audience. And so that's really the first step. And then from there, um, I would do some preliminary research. So uh, ideally, I would list out the, the buyer persona or the ideal customer uh, profile. And so like title or titles that I would group together, um, company size, if, if that's possible, uh, industry, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then once I have all of that listed out, I'll usually try to pick a handful of profiles that meet this criteria, um, ideally from the actual CSV that I'm going to use for targeting. And so I'll look on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, 
uh, whatever else and um, actually look at their profiles. By the way, can you guys see? There's like some kind of like dust storm right outside my window uh, <laughs> on the street. That's like it's almost like a tornado. It looks insane, and I'm really glad I'm not outside. But it's so are we going to catch uh, you know a, a, a big event on on camera? Yeah, you, yeah. You know, keep filming, uh, Heather. Don't cut. No, <laughs> you just have to see this just for one second. I hate to bother you, but like this is crazy. Um, yeah. Anyway. No, I so, can. Sorry. So. Can you guys see it? I mean, small. I can. No, it's too small. We can't see it. That's no, too bad. Yeah, it? uh, it's crazy. But anyways, um, <laughs> You're mini safe. tornado outside my window. Um, anyways, so uh, once I'm on their LinkedIn, their Twitter, um, everything else, I'm looking for keywords that are going to resonate with them. I'm looking to understand the tone, um, to mirror the kind of language and tone that they're using um, on Twitter with the tweets that they're doing within their own profile that they built on LinkedIn. A place of gold that you can look are the recommendations they've given and received on LinkedIn because this mm. shows you not only how um, they view their peers and what kind of KPIs and things they like to talk about, but also mm -hmm. how other people view them. And so oftentimes when we ask for recommendations or give them, people also ask us to include certain keywords or KPIs. So those are really rich. Uh, if you weren't going to look at anything other than like 10 seconds, I would just go to the recommendations of LinkedIn and be uh, you can build a composite of who that buyer persona is. The more research you can find, the better. Just get a strong sense of who they are. And then I actually like to take one person to write for, even though I'm writing a template that's going to hundreds or thousands of people, mm -hmm. just to get a sense of who the audience is and make it sound like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, even if it is mass. Mm -hmm. And so... Seems like the dust is getting on the internet. Oh, yeah. Are you breaking... It seemed like I was breaking up for a second. Really? Oh, yeah. It's the storm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy That's a storm. Storm. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, cool. so uh, th that's sort of how you start. You just focus on uh, those, those core benefits and their pain points. And uh, from each, each concept, you create a different email. And that's pretty much how you do it. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I really like what you said about talking to one person uh, rather than talking to, to many, just because I feel like that makes it so much more real and, and personable when you're sending out those emails. So that's that's great. Yeah, I like also the uh, the buying buyer persona. I think um, so a lot of things that Heather says is spot on. I will add a few things like sometimes you have a business idea, but it's not really well fleshed out yet. And I think one of the really cool things that you can do at this stage is actually reaching out to industry experts and then just asking them to sort of brainstorm the idea with you in terms of, is it really a problem that we need to solve? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty good to use cold email for that. Uh, I, I was doing it, I actually did it. So I was trying to target the financial planners industry in Australia at some point. So what I did is I went to LinkedIn, figure out who actually was interesting to talk to. Uh, seem to be a leader in the industry and they just basically call email them and say, hey, you know, I um, I want to really help this industry. Uh, is there any chance we can have a chat together and then see if there is anything that, you know, could be done to improve your business regarding X, Y, Z, uh, depending on the business idea you have. And then after that, then you can have like a conversation with them. And then uh, after that, you can switch to the second sort of phase, which is uh, you're trying to build up the, the, uh, the um, your, the idea basically and then you try to get other people on board and then seeing if they're excited by that and uh, I've seen also some some people using podcast interviews as a sort of hook for that or book interviews I think it works extremely great in terms of reply rates um, so that actually you know they just say hey you know I'm doing a book on this subject I'd like to know more can I interview you and then usually they say yes so it's a great way also to connect with people and then after that they can come back and say you know, and then just, just basically uh, poke a bit more about around the problem that you're trying to solve. So I like the buyer, the persona, buyer persona idea, so you can know who you're targeting, but then at the same time, don't think like you, you have to try go into sales mode straight away. And then maybe when you have a business idea, sometimes it's very far-fetched from actually being a sellable, you know, product. And uh, the process of developing that actually could be um, accelerated by just cold email. That's, again, the versatility of code email I was mentioning. Awesome. 
Yeah, no, I know. I love that idea of just reaching out to influencers and having a conversation to make sure that, you know, what you're creating is actually viable. So that's great. And the same is really good for, um, you know, content marketing, biz dev, PR. Just starting those conversations early on and trying to build rapport and give feedback and treat them like real people, not just something or someone that you're trying to extract value from, that mm -hmm. will really help as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of like um, oftentimes when when I create content, I'll, I'll reach out to people and see what they think. You know, people who have shared similar articles just saying like, hey, what do you think of this piece? And it's really nice to actually get feedback um, about the piece and to start a conversation. Pretty neat. All right. So let's move on to the next question here. Um, so what makes a good and a bad cold email? And that one's a pretty broad question. I'm sure you guys have a lot to add. Um, so feel free to, to start out wherever you'd like. Heather, do you want to begin? Sure, yeah. So I think, um, sorry, someone's calling me. I'm turning my phone off. Um, Rejected. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so yeah, so what I was going to say is what makes a good cold email is one that is thoughtful and personal and um, again, resonates to your audience's pain points and desires. Um, and one that feels very conversational as well. And so uh, take that versus what you often have, emails that are too long, emails that sound like monologues, emails that sound very like third person, generic, robotic, just impersonal um, and self-focused. Uh, Oftentimes, they won't have a focus. They'll be rambling on. Uh, good cold emails should focus on one core idea or benefit. And of course, have a really clear call to action, whereas a bad cold email will often have no call to action, or it will be uh, missing, or weak, or um, just, yeah, not good. <laughs> Um, yeah, on top of that, I would say for me, I mean, I would, I would attack straight away the definition of what, a, what is good or bad for a cold email. So for me, a, a good cold email means, you know, you establish a relationship with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, if I, if, I, if I insult you over emails and then I got like great response rates, so you have to figure out what is actually, you know, what is actually good or bad in terms of the response. So mm -hmm. getting the reply is only half of the story. It has to make sure that it's good reply. Mm -hmm. um, one way to achieve that, then after that, it's once you've got this sort of framework as to what is good and what is bad, then in this in this case, you can be more open into getting um, some, I don't necessarily like, I prefer strategies, uh, which Heather talks a lot about, and I absolutely love that. And on top of that, you can go to the tactical level. So some of the tactics are very short-lived. Um, you know, trying to genuinely uh, do a... a a relationship, trying to genuinely open a relationship with someone is a good strategy. It's never, never, never going to change. But the tactics actually go and, you know, they come and buy. So they are short-lived into a certain amount of time. Uh, one thing I like to do is call the market propensity because you're never going to get 100% reply rate. I can't get 100% reply rate from my family. Okay. So you, you won't never get 100% reply rate. Uh, one other thing I do is called a market propensity, and what I do is I actually disguise myself as a client, and I contact these businesses. And when they actually come back with certain uh, certain email, then I know roughly how my market propensity is. So when I did that with financial planner, which you would think that they will take you know every email sort of seriously from a client, then I got only 80% reply rates. So that was it. That was my 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 thing. I knew I couldn't go above 80% reply rate, um, but that's more like black hat. Uh, kind of thing. Um, one of the great things to ensure reply rates and making sure that you know it's 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 it qualifies as a good email in my definition is that you have like a super low call to action, so very low commitments. Most of the time, they're too fuzzy. The prospects mm -hmm. say, "Okay, well, what do I do with that?" You know, it's just not anything clear. So I like to lo lower the um, the commitment level on the other person and then making like super simple to reply a yes or a no. Because, because oh yeah, the bad the bad email. Well, we, we could spend ages talking about what bad emails is, but the bad emails usually try to sell you straight away, and they uh, like they I was move, saying, they move the goal, too the goal, fast. Exactly, the goal is just to establish a link and a relationship. After that, you can you know evolve this relationship. But the first mm -hmm. thing is to get you know, a relationship. So, so that could be as simple simple as like getting a very quick 
you know, a call to action as a yes or no kind of thing. Right. So when you talk about low commitment, so like what sort of, what would be an example of a low commitment ask that, that you would, you know, tell somebody in a, in a cold email? Like, can you just give me a few examples of what that would look like? Uh, for me, uh, one of the um, a lowest commitment one is just reply yes. So reply something yes. like or name. So uh, a super simple email would be like, who is the person responsible for marketing in your company? That's mm -hmm. that's a go to marketing uh, go to market strategy that you could use. It usually yields good benefit, good results. Sorry, um, and you know it's super simple. It's low you know low action to just say hey this is Anna or something like that, you know, this is very super simple, you're not expecting anything from the uh, from the, the reader. Mm -hmm. If you're just asking them like three questions, like, you know, could you let me know your three top problems and also explain me that and that and that, it's like, you know, the guy will never reply or the girl will never reply to you. It's just way too high in terms of commitment. We haven't we haven't built a relationship yet. I'm not mm -hmm. ready to actually write tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can make it simple, you know, just make it clear, you say, Hey, you know, I would really value like an answer from you if you could just say yes, and then we can take it further, or I can send you more information, or just no, and then I make sure you know I won't bother you again. At least you will know where you stand rather than not getting any reply. That's that's mm -hmm. how I would approach that. Awesome. Yeah, I know, and I, I love the fact that you mentioned you know you haven't built a relationship yet because. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? And if we're cold emailing somebody, we haven't established that. And I mean, that's the, that's the whole point is to to start that relationship. And I think like what, what you guys are saying about asking for a low commitment, something low commitment um, is much better. And then people don't get defensive, you know, on the first email and it's not uncomfortable. So. Awesome. All right. So let's see, we're moving along pretty quickly here. So let me get to the next question. Uh, so yeah, just some common fears people have when cold emailing. Um, you know, I know a few of them are like, you know, I don't want to be annoying or I don't want to be intrusive. Um, and so, yeah, what are some fears that you guys have come across, like in your own cold emailing or just people you've spoken to and sort of how do you think they can work through those? Um, do you want to go first, Jeremy? Yeah, I can go first. Go for it. <laughs> that's pretty mm -hmm. much why, you know, I drilled a quick mail as well in, in the beginning. Um, I, f I think there is a huge uh, psychological effect or, or mindset that people are not necessarily aware of when they're actually starting cold emailing and they think like it's easy and so on. Um, but I really think, and that may be my personal view, but I really think like automation's got a lot of advantages over, you know, doing it uh, manually. Um, because one of the big fears like, am I going to bother this person or should I really go for a follow-up right now? And most of the time it depends on your mood. Uh, so that's why it's great when you got like, you know, an application doing it on, um, mm -hmm. in, instead of you having to mentally think like, can I send the email yes or no every time? Uh, because it takes a toll uh, on people's mind. Um, the other thing, like you know, a lot of people have is like you know um, they they see it as the sort of golden scarcity mindset. Like this is only a, you know there is only one prospect in the world that can reply me yes or no. So I have to make sure you know I don't screw it up. It's fine to screw it up. You know, just take you know a big enough market and then you have no problem. And most of the time, if you don't have have a big enough market, your product are not going to be big enough anyway for doing cold emails. So if you have like only 100 people that can buy it in the world, then don't send the email, just go you know, to conferences and then go and network with them. But if you have like a big enough market, then you, sh you shouldn't fear you know, getting like 100, you know, wasting 100 prospects or wasting 200 prospects. Um, so I think that's a common fear, like you think like I have to, uh, the people I'm contacting, you know, I, I can't screw up uh, things. Uh, they, they're afraid of looking foolish, they're afraid of, um, off a lot of things, yeah, that prevents them from doing it well in the beginning, and then just trying to be human and just, you know, establishing a relationship with someone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, those are great points. Um, I would just add, I think, to that, uh, even though sales is human and you should be thoughtful and personal, it still is a numbers game. Um, no matter who you're reaching out to or how many people, you're never going to get 100% response or interest or anything like that mm -hmm. and so you need to have um, enough volume and enough persistence with follow-ups in order to actually get responses and actually statistically speaking um, you want to send eight emails in order to get the maximum response rate possible uh, and so you, if you send an email campaign with eight emails um, you'll get quite a few responses in your first few emails but what we found is 
one third of the total responses from the entire campaign will come from emails five through eight. Wow. So if you're only sending four emails, you're losing on like a third of your leads. And I've sent some people like 16 emails. I'm not recommending you do that to everyone or all the time, but um, you have to be persistent to get a hold of people you really want to get a hold of. And I think uh, there's this fear that you know you're you're not you're not adding value or, or you're being obnoxious or something. And I think mm -hmm. as long as I am targeting the right person and I truly believe I can add value to them or people like them, um, and I'm thoughtful and polite and adding value in every email I send, I'm shameless at sending emails. And that doesn't mean I'm just like pitching them like shameless, like, hey, right. buy my stuff. Um, but I'll be shameless in trying to start a conversation until they tell me, no, I'm not interested, don't talk to me, whatever. Once they do that, I don't have permission to talk to them anymore. But until then, I'll just keep trying to interact until I can start that conversation. That's awesome. Yeah, that, yeah that's, um, um, that's a great point, and I actually missed my, my follow-up point on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that. It will come back, it will come back. Oh, no, 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 I say, basically, if you have a product you're really believing in, then this is your duty to go out on and making sure that you, you improve people's life. That's just end to that. And if you can reach them through email, then go for it. Definitely. Yeah, and I agree with Heather. I think that if you have something you really want to spread the word about and something you really think could benefit you know, the person on the other end, you won't feel bad about following up because you genuinely want to help them and you genuinely think it'll change their life. So that's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, so next question. Uh, what are some different ways you can provide value in a cold email? So yeah, you guys, you talk a lot about providing value and I think um, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what that means. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think it means pitching their product, you know, that's providing value. Um, and so what are some other ways people can provide value in their cold emails and like first touch emails? So uh, different ways to add value. So. Obviously, interesting facts or statistics or information. Um, you don't want to give away too much. So when I when I say add value, I'll often sort of tease the promise of value. And so, like for example, um, I have an idea that can uh, fix Company X's sales bottleneck. I recently uh, was able to triple the qualified leads for a company Y by da 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 without saying everything that I did. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of promising that I have value. I'm going to solve your problem. I didn't say how. Um, I didn't give everything away, but I'm teasing that I can add value to you. Um, and so things like that or even um, like ideas, advice, um, even just compliments, ego stroking, flattering mm -hmm. them. Uh, these are all positive tactics. You could also uh, use the opposite. You could turn value into fear or fear of loss um, to try and move them to want to respond because they, they feel like they're going to lose out on something or have a problem if they don't talk to you, uh, which is sort of the idea of like a sales bottleneck. Fix your sales bottleneck. That's, that's a fear that I've, I'm fixing, that I've sort of turned into like a fear meets value thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, um, any thoughts, Jerry? you want to go now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, um, well, basically, you don't get to choose what value is for your your prospect. Um, it could, you know, you could propose, for example, a personal demo and then take them over some other things that could be highly valued, like, oh, someone can help me, or that could be like bothering them because, or maybe even insulting them. So um, you don't get That's to true. choose what value is. Mm -hmm. you know, like Heather said, it could be a compliment, it could be simply paying attention. I think the biggest value that you can usually give to people is just making sure that you know you, you, um, you are close to them in a sense that you've done your work and you spend time on, the, on them for whatever reason. So uh, that's why compliment goes well. Usually you do a compliment based on something that they know or you know of them and that means like, okay, well that person actually did pay a bit of attention you know, on me, so I will reciprocate. You know, the reciprocity um, uh, effect is really strong. Yes. So if you spend time on me, I'll spend time on you. This is just as simple as that. Awesome. Cool. So next question: What does a good follow-up email? Just a quick, um, just a quick thing. There's a really good book called Influence by Cialdini. Oh yes, that's one of my favorite books too. That that is a great book. 
Never read it. <laughs> and in it, and he explains the the psychology uh, behind it and so on. And this is great. This is a really good stuff. Cool. So it's called Influence by who? Cialdini. Oh, awesome. C i l a l g i n i. I didn't yeah. know the spelling, but you may be. I got it right next to me somewhere yeah, in my stack of books. Yeah, it's a great book. I have it too. Nice. Yeah, I've heard of it. I gotta check that out. And it's an easy it. read. Yeah. Yes. Sweet. But it's fun. The guy is a sucker. He falls for everything, so he, he decided to just uh, <laughs> document everything he was falling for. This is awesome. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So, yeah, the next question is just what does a good follow-up email look like? Um, what should be covered in the follow-up email? Um, you know, how long it should be? Um, if, you know, I, I think a lot of people think when I send a follow-up email, I'll just send a repeat of my first email. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you guys kind of what you think about that. Uh, Heather, did you want to start? Yeah, so um, I guess to say what a good follow-up email would look like, I'll tell you what a bad one would look like. Um, so don't do exactly what you just said. Um, it, a lot of times people will be really redundant and repetitive and like say exactly the same thing or pretty much the same thing or, and just add, hey, I'm following up. Did you get my message? Don't do that. It pisses people off. It's obnoxious. It does not add any new value. Um, that's probably the quickest way to get marked as spam and develop a problem with like a blacklist on your IP. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we actually often don't send what are called or known as bump emails, but rather send emails on new threads. Um, and part of this has to do with the fact that um, in most cases, only about half or two thirds, if you're lucky, of your recipients are reading any given email. And so with that in mind, uh, we found that it does depend a little bit on your uh, ratio of open to response, but in many cases, you're better off sending separate threads with different subject lines to try and like maximize the variance, to have a mm -hmm. variety of different messages and test to see what does and what doesn't work, um, at least initially in that sort of testing, iterating phase. Uh, and then you can maybe reuse some of the same ones, but we'll get a larger percent of our uh, audience to actually open and read the emails when we do different subject lines rather than just bumps. Because think about it logically, if, if your prospects haven't already uh, responded to your previous email, why? One, uh, they haven't opened and seen it at all. So the subject line didn't work or they were busy or whatever. Um, if the subject line wasn't interesting, it won't be interesting later. Um, mm -hmm. if, if they did read it and that subject line uh, was interesting enough for them to open and read it but they didn't respond, uh, using that same thread, unless they're just too busy and didn't respond, probably won't work either. So um, based on logic and statistics, we found that different subject lines and completely different threads are better in most cases. But with regards to that in the question, um, anything that adds new value. So the way mm -hmm. I think about email campaigns uh, and creating a campaign, so what we do is we take their prospect and we think about what their pain points and the things that they desire and everything else about them are, and then write a series of bullet points out uh, with different things that we then turn into ideas for emails. And so before we even start running a single email, what we'll typically do is write um, a couple dozen ideas, and we'll pick like the best eight to make our sequence of eight, and we'll even have two variants. but. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is hit as many value propositions as possible. And the reason for this is sort of two things. Um, when you're thinking about who you're emailing, especially when you're emailing hundreds or thousands of people, uh, you have an audience, like any audience, which is on a normal curve. And so on one end, you'll have the people that are super interested, want to talk to you, they have a huge pain point, maybe they've heard about you, they'll respond right away, not a problem. The other end, you have the people who hate you, they hate cold email, they say, F off, don't email me again, take me off your list. These two groups are not the issue. What the issue is what is in the middle. And those individuals in the middle might be busier, some might be busier, some might be more free than others. Um, some will be moved by a certain value prop and not other another value prop and vice versa. Uh, some will be more skeptical, some will be more idealistic. 
So when you think of a sequence, you actually ideally want to maximize the variance if you're dealing with the actual population on different things that you think will work. And then from the results, you test and see what is and isn't working, cut out what is not, triple down and test more on what is. Um, but again, the, the key to this is just really um, new, unique value in every email. Nice. Yeah, I have a slightly different approach uh, to Heather. I think I think I think you, you got to you effectively got. I think it depends highly on on, on the type of market you're you're trying to do. That's so true. Some market they're they're super busy. They got like hundred emails a day, and you know it could go very quickly. So if you ever do a bump email, like please please don't repeat yourself. Just just leave a previous email eventually, and then just do a straight bump, and then just say hey you know just uh, just wanted to make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. And if you're not interested, that's fine. So one bump email, yeah, totally fine. But don't do seven bump emails, right? Um, so th there is a line here. Um, the other thing I, I like is that um, so different value is interesting. I would actually change that by saying different uh, approaches or different ways of uh, of allowing the customer to reply or the actually the prospect to reply. So sort of different call to actions. Uh, because some people are more receptive to some way of answering than others, mm -hmm. so you can effectively, um, you know, just just change the focus on what the call to action is on each of those follow-up emails. You don't have to include the previous threads; that's fine. And uh, yeah, like as I say, you know, test, 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 because each market is different. The wording is extremely important, and. Um, um, oh, I think I forgot to say something. Yeah, I'm always like that. I forgot to actually say something super important in what makes a good email is that um, you have to, the same way you have to use the same wording as them, you have to bridge as much gap as you can. So cold email doesn't mean, you know, an email out of nowhere. You can figure out what my audience is. So for example, let's say I was, I was emailing other founders then I would probably subcategorize all those founders into founders who drive motorbike, and I would tell them that I drive a Gladius 650, mm -hmm. just because I love motorbiking. And then people just opening this, like, wow, that's two bridge gaps already. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, he's a founder like me, and oh, he likes motorbiking like me. I'm more inclined to respond to this guy because he doesn't seem like a stranger. Most of the time, people think like cold emails, like I have to, you know, to be as cold as possible, very formal mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But Actually, it's more like you, you grab someone in a bar and then you start a conversation with them. I can tell you that you know, within one sentence or two, you're going to try to figure out what are the commonalities between you and him. And I think that's what cold email is really about. So do your research, like, uh, like as I said, by in persona, and then try to fill as much gap as possible. What are the commonalities between me and that prospect? And then just you know, ride on that one. Um, yeah. So long-winded on uh, what the follow-ups are, but I think that's... No, I think you're, you're totally right with that, um, and I think that's a great point. And we do similar things, too, especially with our own outbound. We can't always do that with our clients' outbound because they don't have all that data, but we definitely do that <laughs> in um, the email campaign. You didn't, know, you didn't know I was driving a motorbike, huh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I did it. But no, I think that... That's the reason why that works, in, in addition to the commonality, is that makes you human. That just made you exactly. human. You're not a robot. Robots don't say, hey, I like motorbikes. And even exactly. if they end up not liking motorbikes as much as you, you're a human. Mm -hmm. And so the more relevant it is, the better. But um, I think that's very important for, for that distinction. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, and I think it's a good point because, you know, we do that in person all the time, you know, and then just doing that over email is kind of the natural thing to do. So that's great. All right. Yeah, so. I don't quite understand why the psychology changed as soon as we go through, you know, a, a different medium. Right. Like, you know, email, so. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, uh, I was actually having this conversation over Twitter direct messages the other day with um, a prospective client of ours. And um, another uh, like fan, sort of like sales folk fan, this awesome salesperson. And we were interacting. We were talking about how sales should be more personal and human, and how people don't get it. Like exactly, just the way we are talking right now over direct message IM is the way you want to interact. And obviously, you're probably not going to be quite as informal as like LOL, W2F, things <laughs> like that. But 
You have um, more than 140 you know, characters, of course. Yeah, right? <laughs> but um, you know, you want it. You want it to feel more like you know. I don't know if I want to say a Facebook message, but like at least LinkedIn messages shouldn't feel that different than a Facebook message, and neither should emails. It's all online communication. Mm-hmm. Hold on. Definitely. Okay, uh, so this next question is, um, I think it would be useful to everyone here. Uh, just what's an ideal response rate people should shoot for? Um, I think a lot of us, like we send out cold emails and we, we think we're doing good, but we're not really sure. So um, you guys have you know, a ton of experience with this and I thought you know, might have something interesting to share about you know, what's a good response rate. So um, Heather, did you want to start with that? Sure. Um, so first of all, I'll just say what the industry standard is, which I think is unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> the industry standard is somewhere between like three and five percent, um, and I believe that's not even like counting like positive versus negative, which is wow. just crazy low. Um, but the response rate I recommend people to aim for, um, and it, it varies based on industry, product market fit, list quality, deliverability, blah blah blah. Um, but somewhere between, I would say, 10 to 35% for a campaign, you can certainly get higher than that, um, and I have, and some of our clients have. Um, but in order to get higher than that, you need a really solid list, really good product market fit. Um, and when I say solid list, I mean like no bounces. These are people that like definitely need your product. Um, and you're probably appending some additional information into your, your CSV to make it even more personalized, to seem even more human. Um, and in those cases, I've seen campaigns in the 40s and even had one of my own in like 67, 68%, but that is not normal. Those are like freakish outlier <laughs> things where you have super, super, super good product market fit and like you've gone above and beyond and you kind of got lucky. Um, I think what is reasonable to aim for is somewhere between 10 and 35%. I would say most of our campaigns get somewhere between like 18 to 25, 26%. Mm-hmm. Um, and just thinking of not everyone's going to be a fit uh, for you and contact information, even when you have the best contact information in the world, won't always be accurate. People change jobs. Uh, you know, things happen. Companies go out of business. and Domains are still there, they're still valid, but people aren't responding. And so I think those are reasonable numbers. Jeremy, what, what do you think about that? Um, a lot of good things you said, and it's quite interesting because I never really paid attention about industry standards kind of thing. I just laugh at it, mostly. <laughs> but it's like, man, if someone's got 3 to 5%, I tell them to you know change their approach because it doesn't work. So yeah. usually I, I have a sort of... Um, uh, scale in my head, and the scale is different whether you're using follow-ups or not. So make sure that that also has play a huge role in terms of the number of replies you get. Um, so in terms of pure reply, and we are not talking about ratio. Uh, I'm trying to get more information into ratio between positive and negative. Uh, right now, I don't have that. I don't have enough information on that. But I can definitely give you some good scale into what is a good campaign in terms of uh, reply rate. So what I've seen is like everything under 10% is pretty much unacceptable or it's not working. I think it's shit. Agreed. Uh, <laughs> really and bluntly. Uh, everything between 10 and 20, I think it's low. But everything between 20 and 30, I think is, the, is what you should aim for, between 20 and 30. Mm. If you get between 20 and 30, then that's fine. You've got probably other problems to fix than your reply rate. Um, I would just say one, can I interrupt you and say one yeah, thing? Sure. So I. I 95% agree with everything you said. I think the only time when it would be maybe between 10 and 20% would be in the case of companies that, um, let me give you an example, this is a made up example, but I'm selling roofs and um, I'm targeting people who have houses and they have roofs and when it's raining um, I get better numbers but not everyone has a leaky roof and so when they have one they need, need, need it. But the probability of which is a little bit in the dark. And so there are definitely cases where there's products and services that are very, 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 very needed. Um, but it's not always relevant. And certain times they can kind of trigger around like time of year, or things like that, mm-hmm. to get it better. Um, but they still have to do some outbound. And for those people, I, I strongly suggest they also do content marketing and, and other kinds of marketing to create awareness because 
they are a little bit more shooting in the dark. But if they can't meet their numbers with that, they're going to do some outbound, and it'll probably be between, like, hopefully at least 10%, but probably, like, more like 10 to 16 or 18%. And in those cases, I think, like, those are acceptable numbers when you really aren't sure, and it's it's sort of, it's kind of a product market fit issue, but it's really not. It's just sort of trying to find those indicators to build an even better list to try and figure out who is most likely to have a leaky roof. Who bought their roof this many years ago or, you know, has this kind of roof? And then mm -hmm. you, you match that back to whoever you're targeting. Are there certain technologies or certain things that would indicate they're more likely to be a better fit. But other than that, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think we can reconciliate the, uh, the two approach very easily because your example is this more B2C as I see it. Yeah. And B2C getting 10% is already pretty great. So that's that's effectively your your I actually think it actually be roofs. I made that up. But there are B2B cases. <laughs> there are B2B cases. Yeah, I, I really thought you did. Damn it. No, no. Like like for example, okay. um research. <laughs> Research, uh, like market research, for example, that's something if someone needs it and they're in the market to do that, or if they're in the market for like fundraising or something. Yeah, like that, well, okay. you know, I, I would be okay in having, I would be okay in actually splitting it into different verticals and having a vertical doing 5% and then in this case, okay, maybe it's not worth doing versus another vertical 25 rather than actually mixing the whole pool. So it comes also into segmentation. That's quite important for, for, for that. Um, I'm just going to finish the uh, the sort of scale I had in mind uh, because I think everything between uh, after 40 this is achievable and I've seen that happening quite often even 50 but as soon as you reach that then you have to have a really good strategy and and, and tactics to approach so for example I give you a good example actually uh, one guy actually was targeting some uh, I don't want to, to tell too much because he asked me not to, so I will, I will take another example. But he was basically targeting like newcomers into an industry, a specific industry. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny one, but it's still, it's, it's still quite big actually. But um, so he was basically getting, getting feedback or getting emails whenever someone new came into this industry. And then he just contact them and say, hey, welcome to this industry. Here's some links that could help you out and so on. Is there anything I can do for you? And by the way, this is a problem we're solving. If you're interested, just give me a call. Otherwise, you know, I'd, I'd still be interested to talk to you. But the idea was like it was super targeting into something that was relevant for them at that time. And uh, and the, the the best email sequence I had on the system was one guy just building bridges. So he basically say, hey, I'm doing um, uh, I'm doing an entrepreneurship course, and I'm doing uh, this uh, studies. And those studies actually lead to the job that you know of the people he was interviewing. So, for example, if you were, if we say video games as an example, then he was doing a master in video games and he wanted to reach out to them. So people kind of relate to them like, okay, it's not really a sales call. It's more like I see myself when I was younger, mm -hmm. and and then they want to naturally help those people. So that that worked really really well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, plus that's just flattering too if you're reaching out to somebody you know for advice, um, you know. Just saying, hey, that's you, point. That's, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's it's flattering, point. right? So, depends depends what you're doing and your strategy. But I like, I really like your your vision. I, I was struggling to figure out how to actually put it into into words. But Heather said it very well. Is like, you contact your first lead to build your next list. That's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> that's awesome. I really love that. Cool. All right. So next one is just what's the best cold email you guys have ever received um, or heard of? So if you haven't received a cold email ever that's blown your mind, uh, you can also reference, you know, articles you've heard about. Um, but yeah, I mean, is there are there any emails that stand out to you guys? And do you remember what they contained? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to start? Yeah, OK, I can start. So first of all, I don't have much, many of these. <laughs> Let's say that the vast majority is really rubbish. Right. Uh, the one I get where I actually spend the efforts to reply, they're not even that great either, but it's low effort. It's really like, you know, uh, do you need this service, yes or no kind of thing. So I just reply no and I move on. Um, but I did receive one that actually inspired me at the very beginning of Quick Mail. I absolutely loved it. And I can't recall the content, but I can recall the title. And I signed up to Strikingly, which is uh, a service. I'm going to put it into the chat. But that's a service to create web pages. And I was just, just wanted to experiment with one thing. So I signed up for that. 
I received an email from the founder because it's pretty new. It was a pretty new product at that time, and then the title was uh, "Coffee Maybe?" Question mark. I just loved it because it was a whole all about tone setting. So one thing mm-hmm. I, I I'm not that big on saying like you should you know really think about your your title for a long 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 time because the same title title could lead to really different results, uh, good and bad. But I am very strong about choose a title that is a promise to your content, uh, to your body content. Mm-hmm. So for example, if I say quick question, don't send three pages about things, right? <laughs> so make it short mm-hmm. if you say quick question. And I like the fact of the coffee maybe, I think it was very conversational, which actually, you know, it was like not really salesy or anything, and it made me more willing to actually just engage with that person. And since cold email is all about engaging with someone else, I think it was like, you know, perfect promises and I really like this one. So I think that was my favorite one I received so far. It was like non, non-pushy, conversional, just trying to help generally. And then I was drawn into replying and then engaging into a conversation with that person. So really cool stuff. I used it successfully next. And I had like you know, 40% reply rate, so that was good. Awesome. Um, there's, let's see, there's a handful. Um, a lot of them end up on our Hall of Shame, but uh, there's some good ones. <laughs> Let me actually see. I actually got a really good one the other day. Um, it actually, it wasn't, the most recent one I have in my mind wasn't totally cold. I had signed up for a trial, but they sent a very, the rep sent a very personalized email. I just want to read it, just because the, the same approach could work cold, and I was very impressed. Um, it was from someone at intercom.io. Her name is Kathy Lee. And it said, um, hey, Heather, it's great to see you've been checking out Intercom, especially because we're completely on the same page with hating bad cold emails. <laughs> Check out this blog post our VP sales just wrote on why he believes cold calling is dead. Um, this isn't just a personal philosophy of ours, but we use uh, this in our own product and Intercom to prevent automated emails uh, from coming off as cold and impersonal. I'd love the chance to chat about how we do that and how, or, and would also love to learn what brought you our way. How do you envision using Intercom with sales folk? So That's awesome, isn't it? Five, six sentences, I mean, it's, it's sort of warm, but you're very thoughtful, very personal. Um, they took the time to do that, and uh, just very human, and, and it adds value. It strokes my ego, and uh, the article they shared was actually really, really good. So I enjoyed that email a lot, and um, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that's great. The subject line could have been better. It was a sales folk plus intercom, but Uh, I just registered for intercom, so I was like, okay, might as well see what this is. Yeah. But um, other than that, it was good. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. We hate bad cold emails, too. Like, that's so targeted. Exactly. No, exactly, and, and they definitely custom wrote that. The problem with something like that is it's not nearly as scalable. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you could take something like that and target it towards people who've been, you know, writing about outbound or like different tools in the space that are kind of related to that, um, or even something a little more generic but positive compliment. Definitely. Cool. Um, well, yeah, you guys, we're, we're starting to run out of time here, so we better get to the cold email teardowns. Um, so, yeah, we're basically just going to be showing some cold email examples, and you guys will get your chance to sort of tear them apart. So, to speak. Um, so nice. this should be pretty fun. All right, so we'll start out with this one by Dill, um, who's actually part of our Facebook group, and, yeah, he wanted to get your oh, feedback nice. on this email. It's not, it's, not, it's not terrible. Um, it's I think it's it's nice and short. Um, I think it would be nice to have some context around like why you had to reach out, um, just to sort of you know put that out there really quickly because you're saying it, but it's sort of creepy if you just say it. But if you say because I also like blah 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 too or something, you know, like put bridge. it in common. Yeah, yeah have that bridge. Um, and then I think I would like to have, rather than would you be down to chat, have something first of like, um, 
I'm in, I wanted to speak with you because I'm thinking into getting into the market as an entrepreneur. And then maybe one more sentence that's like more focused on them, um, tailored to that person and not just you. And then um, I would have after the call to action, you know, uh, would you mind taking 15 minutes to talk to me about renewable, uh, about the renewable industry space? Thanks in advance. But especially if you can, if you have something to offer to them uh, beyond just ego stroking, something that you think would be of value to them, mm -hmm. put that in there. Like, And I'll often put in parentheses in exchange for your time. Um, I'm happy to share my insights on XYZ. But you yeah, you need to know PPS. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't see yeah, that. exactly. You don't see it because you're <laughs> reading. That's another point I was about to say. It's like it's too late. Yeah, and I think also I wouldn't do the correct person approach for an email like this, especially if you're just trying to like have Sorry. advice. But it almost yeah. like undoes everything. That is, you know, exactly. I, I'm very, I use that very sparingly. I use that only when I'm trying to find people with a, a specific role with an ambiguous title. Other than that, I don't use it much because I think people are using it to death and overusing and abusing mm -hmm. it. That's what that's what I was saying about tactics. They only yeah. short lived. Exactly. Yeah. Any any tactic is gonna die because everyone will start using it, and that's why when people say, "Hey, post a template," I don't do that anymore because I gave Aaron Ross that template for the sequel to Predictable Revenue like a year ago that he posted on HubSpot, and since then I've seen dozens of companies rip off that template that was written for a very specific client in a very mm. specific industry. And they've killed it. The client was happy. They got a bunch of money out of it before I ever posted it, and they gave me permission. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's now dead, and anyone who still tries to use it, which people are still trying to use it to this day, does not work, and it's not even relevant to their industry or business or customer. Yeah, it is sad. People mix tactics and, and strategies. You know, with a strategy, you can build an infinite number of tactics. Mm -hmm. But then people just all go after the Whoa. same tactic and then screw it and then you know it's gone. So mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna tweet you on that one, Jeremy. <laughs> go for it. Um, yeah, same thing. I think Heather said it way better than me because she's more oh man, I don't 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 move already to the second one. I haven't done my uh. haven't given my two cents on the first one. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's fine. Just call to action is too fuzzy. I like the call to action being last last. Mm. Because otherwise people forget, and you know even if it's three sentences in between, it's like what should I do already? And it's 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 like very, very blurry. So just you know if if you up for it, you know I would appreciate just just replying yes or something like that. So I can I, I will send you some some information that I already collected that could be interesting too. It's like you know sort of hook or lead, and uh, and then the bridge yeah is missing definitely as um. And forget drop the PS. Uh, the first PS is, is is not good. You shouldn't mm -hmm. actually change the the focus of the reader to something else. Like, oh well, I couldn't get you. Well, how about that? You know, it's like it's like those people trying to sell you one thing. You go away and say, well, how about that? You know, and then uh, oh, I can bag, and then all those things you actually don't need. Yeah. So nah, yeah. Keep it for the follow up. That that is actually a good tactic for a follow up. So you could come back and say, actually, you know. Maybe you're not the right person. Can we, you know, or are, are you, or something like that? So, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, that was yeah, good. I like that. Cool. All right, so yeah, I can see you got shit lots of experience on that, Heather, to actually uh, comment on existing uh, on existing templates. I like that. Me, me tearing people down. No, I, I like editing them <laughs> and actually improving them, not just like destroying and stomping on people. Although it's fun when they're really, really, really bad. Um, <laughs> So, okay, um, I would make the subject line shorter. Um, so, um, let's see. So, you like, the person likes golf. I don't know if, if the actual recipient likes golf. If they do, maybe you could say, like, first name, round of golf, question mark, and maybe round of golf at place, whatever, like, Christmas Beach or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. to make it sound even more personalized. Um, I think I, one thing I've seen people do a lot of times is like put a whole sentence in their subject line. Don't do this. It'll get cut off. 
try to often keep your subject line to like, I would say six, seven words max. Most of my subject lines are like three or four words, though. Yeah, something like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and like intrigue does better. You just want them to open. I think of an email almost like as a funnel that you need to optimize. The subject line only does one thing, to get them to open and read on. So you just need to catch their attention to do that. The first sentence that, uh, gets them to be interested and keep reading more and dive in. The body is the social proof. That's where your credibility is built and um, trust is starting to form and you know value is being added or fear is being poked at. And then the call to action is just a simple thing that incentivizes them to respond. So if you just think of it almost like a funnel and each thing is trying to get them to go to the next stage, um, but all moving towards one goal to get them to respond and have a conversation, uh, that'll help you a lot. But um, yeah, so I, I would say that. Uh, and then, oh wait, we have something in the quick mail chat. Maybe that's from the recipient. Um, yeah, I'm okay if you guys are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting coached live. It's for free. Um, Has your charge right? 2,000 bucks for a minute. I, I, yeah, right? No. <laughs> um, so I do, I do have an hourly rate that is not free, so you guys are lucky. <laughs> um, let's see. So I would say... Um, I would just get to the point... I mean, I don't know if it's you're sending this right around the holidays. It's not really holidays anymore, but I would say... Um, this sounds like a follow-up email. Um, if it isn't a follow-up email, I would just say, um, I wanted to reach out because um, I'm coming into, and say the city name, maybe not just in town, um, next week for, like, you know, I don't know, like, probably say what the event is. They don't know what your next event or mixer is. So like, especially if it's a conference that people know about, like, oh, I'm going to Sastre or Dreamforce or something. Um, say the name of it. Like, hey, I'm coming into San Francisco next week uh, for Dreamforce, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know if we could grab a quick coffee, a coffee or something, um, or if I could buy you a coffee, even better. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know... Actually, where the golf stuff is relevant, unless the person is playing golf or you're inviting them to play golf. Like, I don't really know. I feel like this is doing too many things. Like, they're talking about mm -hmm. golf. They're talking about a mixer. They're talking about a private equity firm. Right, yeah. And there's, like, all these bullets, and it's just sort of, like, all over, like, are you trying to invent them to and or invite them to play golf with you? Are you trying to get them to get a coffee with you? Are you trying to get them to go to your mixer? Like, what are you trying to do? And try to just focus on doing one thing and use the other thing for a follow-up email. Maybe, oh, maybe, cool. maybe you invite them first, right? Just to this event. Yeah. And then um, you're. Oh, hey, actually, I have a couple. I have an extra spot uh, in my golf caddy. I don't play golf, but my golf yeah. caddy or whatever. Um, you want to join me and so and so, mm -hmm. or you know whatever like that. And obviously, you're not going to send that to a million people who, unless you want to have your own golf tournament. Um, but you know, have them be different, different things. And maybe one of them is like Harry and Tom, like, oh, by the way, we're actually throwing this private dinner with so and so and so and so. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be my guest? And I've done that. I I have parties here in our place whenever. Um, Whenever there's a conference in town, and I invite like a number of the speakers that I know that are speaking, and then I'll pick a few target customers that I want to get to know or influential people, and I'll say, hey, I'm having a party at like blah, 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 and they know the name of that building, because most people do, and so-and-so uh, and so-and-so and -so are coming. Um, I don't know if you have time or not, but would you like to be my guest? And people always jump on that. So people like free food, and they like hanging out with other awesome people that they want to be hanging out with anyways. Mm -hmm. So try to try to convey something like that and, and break this up into like two or three emails and no yeah. bullet points if it's cold. I like that. Yeah, that's great. Whatever she said, I think uh, she covered a lot of ground. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty spot on. <laughs> You're happy with that, Nate, by the way? Nate said he sent it to 5K people and had 100 registered for that. 
Let me could have had two. This exact email. Well, I think I think the issue is it's just like it's doing a lot of different things at once. I think you yeah. can get better results um, by. There's just that like that fear that. of missing out on information. Therefore, yeah. we want to add everything yeah. to it. Good stuff. Thanks, Nate. I'm glad you're getting value out of that. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, and uh, another thing I noticed, just want to point out, there's a typo here at the end. Let me know either way, um, and he has an apostrophe going on there. And oh, I, I thought that was like, just on my computer you know what? screen. You know I what? thought that I was dust. Love when there is mistakes like that because it makes things human. So you know, I I, I always find like be amazing, and sometimes I switch some letters without you know not by mistake. So I always type them manually. So sometimes it comes up good, sometimes it comes up by a mistake. But again, that's make it not a robot. That makes it human. So totally happy with having spelling mistakes and stuff. No problem. I, I, it depends on your audience. If you're like dealing with marketers, they'll attack you, uh, <laughs> or any like grammar Nazi type people. But like one thing I would add is um, be human and be a little bit weird. I'm naturally a weird person, so that's not hard for me to do. <laughs> but um, I had one email I sent out that was something like kimchi and octopus or something strange like that. And that was the subject line. And um, it had a crazy high open rate of like 80-something percent. And a really high response rate, too, because it was right around Thanksgiving. And I said yeah, something it's like, cow, right? yeah, yeah. And I, I've used stuff in like, hey, what are you eating? I'm eating kimchi and octopus. And da 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 da. And, and I've used <laughs> it not just in newsletter. I used it in um, a cold email. And then I used it in my newsletter because I saw it had high open. And you know, anything that can make you human, especially when it's relevant and like connecting to them, but even like little strange things, if they're not relevant, they're just making you human. If you don't go too overboard, they're good. Um, and even just having like a quote in your, your signature that's kind of unusual but interesting is another way to do that too. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that advice of like not being afraid to be weird. I think that's awesome. I like that. I'm going to make that a Twitter quote right now. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is funny how people do the other way around. Like we say, they are going formal and everything, but then by doing that, they just blend in and then don't become remarkable anymore. So the yeah. very same thing they fear is actually hurting them by not doing it. Yeah. Well, I think also, um, I think a lot of times people just want to be like sheep and copy other people and, and copy tactics and so. copy things. And that's, that's why um, we have the orange goat on our website, because I say, don't be a sheep, be a goat. And so I think a lot of times it's, people want to like get advice or get something that someone else is doing and copy it. But at the end of the day, you really just have to kind of look inside and think, who am I? What value do I add? What makes me interesting and unique? And leverage that. Is it that you know you were really good at some sport or cooking or you know whatever or right you know whatever your thing is without like seeming like a huge narcissist? Find a way to just weave that in lightly somewhere here and there to make you human. And you can apply the same thing with your branding throughout your Twitter, your LinkedIn, everything else. My Twitter handle and my LinkedIn tag says the economist who bitches about cold email. The reason for that is I'm an ex-economist. I'm not just another sales consultant or copywriter or marketer or whatever. I'm an ex-economist. That implies that I'm analytical, blah, 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 something or other. And Bitches about cold email. That's what I do. I'm carrying apart cold email, but I'm a bitch, and I like to bitch and critique and be cynical. And so, like, all these little things weave in with my brand that is offline and online. The more you do that as an entrepreneur or as a salesperson, the more your emails and anything you say will be unforgettable, and it will stick with people. Awesome. Love that. Okay, so let's see. Anything more to add on this email, you guys, before we move on to the next one? Nope. Okay, this one's from Logan. He's part of our Facebook group. Um, and, yeah, so Ooh, he asked us to tear this down. Hey, Logan, what's up? <laughs> hi, Logan. Um, let's see. So, Jeremy, you want to give a crack at this one? Oh, man, you're doing it so so well, <laughs> and I was wondering. Either All right. way. <laughs> so 
can you help me? Then obviously someone is um, begging for something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. So, but if you if they're curious, then they, they may just open it, which is you know half of the battle for you. Uh, find your contact information online. What would be good is to figure out where exactly online because people like specificity. Uh, and I feel the need to reach out to someone with your experience. Um, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's 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 just too vague. I think I think the 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 idea is there. I think I'm not quite sure with the substance itself. Uh, my name is X. I'm an entrepreneur doing research, so that's cool. Now I know who I'm talking to. I got a better picture. Private investigator industry. Wow, interesting. So careful, you know. If I will actually joke, that one of the things I, I love doing is actually be playful with my audience. So, for example, if you're contacting the private investigator industry, or so uh, maybe private investigators then I would put some stuff they can check me on. So, you know, I save you time on checking on myself, here's the link, and then you got all the stuff that a private investigator will probably check on you, uh, things like that. Uh, my goal is to learn about the biggest pain in your business and to solve the problem. So, okay, that's your goal. What's in it for me? I don't know what yet. Uh, what's your biggest frustration with your business? Um, love to hear back for you even. Yeah, that's a typical one. So when we talk about tactic versus strategy, then this is a typical tactic that's been used for quite some time in the group, I know. Uh, it works, it's been proven to work, but will it work, you know, long term? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I will probably be more specific uh, into bigger circulation, maybe regarding X or Y. Or otherwise, I will just go ahead and then maybe do a tactic about a podcast or an interview. So I sort of strike their ego, and at the same time, I can learn on the, on the industry for you know uh, reaching out to really good people very easily. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Um, uh, well, I think also to your your exact point, what is the value in it for this person to respond? What's their incentive? Right? Exactly. So, so it's missing the thing like says, you know, happy to share you with you the results, whether you know you, you want to contribute or not, just let me know. Or just say yes or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Cool. By the way guys, I'm gonna have to hop off in five minutes for another call. Uh, any more things we wanna go through? Okay. I think we should wrap up this one then in this case, right? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, usually my webinars are going 45 minutes over the uh, the time, and usually I have time for one hour. So I think Anna's been doing a pretty good job because I think there was only two more examples or something after that. So good stuff. Uh, maybe maybe how how would you feel, Heather, if we just uh, ask the audience if they have one or two quick questions they can on, they can yeah, ask. Yeah, let's do that. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, cool. Would it be better to send 200 personalized email per week or 1,000 semi-generic per week? Uh, uh, go to I get mean, an interview. Figure uh, out your numbers and see the difference, right? But probably I would say more personalized, I'm guessing. But, you know, if your your numbers back out such that, you know, response difference in response rate versus difference in time, um, that you're getting basically a better velocity with one than the other, then go with that. Um, there's an opportunity cost for personalization. Personalization is important. You have a limited market size. You shouldn't just blow through it. But at the same time, um, I don't know what you mean by generic, how generic is generic. Is generic going to get you zero responses, or is it going to get you 15%? Hard to say. Um. Definitely less email for better reply rate because I would say tune and optimize on low yeah. volume or just you know just get it and once you get it and you nail it down then you can scale up and then you're going to have shit lots of replies. I think that's the way to go. Don't don't. Whenever someone say I want to do the shotgun approach, you know, try to be as general as possible and catch you know as many things as you can, you catch nothing. Mm -hmm. So no, I, agree. I would say I agree. the other way around. Be extremely yeah. specific. Figure out, like, like as I say, your buying persona. Uh, make them e super easy for you to answer you, and uh, and then just be yeah, as personal as you can. Bridge as many gaps as you, uh, as many, um, yeah, find as many commonalities as you can. Build as many bridges as you can, and then and then you should be good. I think the question, in order to answer that question, is 
what is generic. And when people say generic, they might just mean scattershot shotgun approach. When I say generic, I don't even usually mean, um, what, what I would mean is just like a basic requirement is to have clear buyer personas and clear benefits versus like personalized would be adding additional custom inserts. So if you mean like, how much personalization should I add, a whole custom sentence versus not, but still having clear buyer personas, I would keep the same answer. But if, if you meant, hey, I'm going to send the same email to a thousand different people, including CTO, CTO, CEO, VP marketing, VP sales, no, don't do that at all. Um, but I think it just it depends on like what you're actually doing. If you are actually targeting them with some amount of personalization, like first name, company, and you're trying to decide how many more custom inserts you should add, then I think you should look at what your numbers are to decide if there's enough of benefit for enough lift or not. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Don't just like blast the market with garbage. Yeah, plus you will be punished. The market yeah, will exactly. Like, yeah. Well, you'll burn the market and you're going to get blacklisted. Exactly. Pretty quickly. It's, mm -hmm. it's a really bad strategy. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions, guys? You can chat with us uh, in the hip chat. So chat.quickmail.io. Ask whatever questions you want. Yeah, I, I'll, stick, I'll stick around. I know Heather has a busy schedule, but for me it's like 8 p.m. in the evening, so I cannot <laughs> chill out. Uh, so I stay around if you guys have any questions. I see a lot of people are on the, on the um, webinar without being in the chat room, so go ahead, go to chat.quickmail.io if you want to ask us any question. That's easier for us to follow up. Cool. Hey, oh, thanks, and, um, mm -hmm. No problem. We should do that again sometime. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. I'd love to. By the way, two things. So um, I put uh, one thing in chat. We have three different guides of resources. One's the human guide. The other is the foolproof guide. The other is uh, the copywriting guide. Um, so cold email guides that are totally free um, at salesfolk.com slash blog slash resources. Um, and Jeremy will probably send a follow-up email with that after I put in chat just in case. Um, I'll Anna do that. She does it way yeah, better than cool. me. Yeah, cool. Hannah will do that. Definitely. And uh, we are also um, about to be launching a course in a few weeks. So uh, cool. if you sign up for the blog, uh, we'll send you emails about that too. So stay posted. That will be pretty effective stuff. Right on. Awesome. Well, thanks okay. so much for joining us, Heather. This was okay, amazing. Thanks, guys. This was awesome. It was great talking to you, Hannah, and good to see you again, Jeremy, and goodbye, everyone bye -bye. else. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Good luck. Bye. -bye.